Hi, I'm Brother Lars Jordan, pastor of the New Bethel Baptist Church located at 2729 Oak Grove Road in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And our Sunday school lesson for the day, the August the 28th, 2016, the ninth lesson of this quarter, according to Boyd, is love for others. And our unifying topic, or even our international topic, is love fulfills the law. And out of the boys book, the Sunday school lesson actually starts at Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2, and the 13th chapter, verses 8 through 10. Our background scriptures are Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2, and the 13th chapter, verses 8 through 14. However, one of our commentaries or lessons actually starts in Matthew, the gospel, according to St. Matthew, verse chapter 22, verse 35, it starts there. And when we get to this lesson, love for others or love fulfills the law. We must understand love, and we're talking about love in the purest form. We're talking about the agape love that so many of us mention all the time, but however, never really comprehend or grasp the, the trueness of this love. This love is the most powerful force on earth. It, it's a love that is that reaches farther and deeper than anything that we could possibly imagine. It is the very love that caused God to send his only begotten son to save a wretch like me and and you. And we he, he did that on our behalf. And when we think of love in, in, in that particular way, we see that it is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus, when he came in this love, compassion for us, this, this, this wonderful, merciful way coming to this, this rejecting world uh, or Christ rejecting world anyway, when he came, he was demonstrating a love that was just unheard of. And when he demonstrated that love, he actually fulfilled the law. He came to fulfill the law. So, when we act in the same type of love, we fulfill the law of love toward our brothers and we fulfill that in, in the love that we share with them. Now, Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of the law. He is the one that died for sin, but we have a part in this. And our part in this, this is mentioned in this lesson today as the apostle Paul is still talking to the church there at Rome. He is right. He wrote this letter to them. He had gone through a great deal of doctrine before he got to this part where he he starts talking about the practical application of the doctrine that had been teaching since the first chapter through the eleventh chapter. And now he's ready to get into this and and help us to understand how we can achieve this goal of living a good Christian life. So I'll, I'll just start there where the, the one commentary did, and we'll go through this quite quickly. But in the 22nd chapter of Matthew, Jesus was headed toward the cross. He was already there in Jerusalem, and he had made that triumphant entry into Jerusalem. But now, just like we will find ourselves when we get down to the, 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 the 12th chapter of Romans, verses 1 and 2, there is a sacrifice that has to be made. And when a sacrifice is made there at the temple, the, the sacrifice that is brought is examined by the priests, by the religious leaders that were in and around the temple courts. They would examine the lamb. They would look at the lamb, see if there was any broken legs, see if there was an eye out. They would examine that lamb. And we found that in those in these verses, 
they actually were, were examining Jesus Christ. They were heralding questions at him one after the other, one group coming after another. He had just silenced in the 34th verse of that 22nd chapter of Matthew, the, the Sadducees. He had put them kind of to shame in, in the thing of when they brought in the question about marriage and whose wife, whose husband would have this wife in heaven and stuff like that. So now Jesus was saying that they didn't understand the way that things are in heaven and, and uh, in the scripture. They didn't have a good grasp on the word of God. But here he would be challenged by a lawyer. Verse 35 says, then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, verse 36 says, master, which is the great commandment in the law? One of them, which was a lawyer, we find in, in, in the gospel according to St. Mark that this was a scribe, a person that knew the scripture quite well. And he came to him and he called him master or teacher, which is the greatest of the commandments, which is what he was asking. Verse 37 says, Jesus said to him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And Mark, in the in the gospel according to St. Mark, he said also with all thy strength. But in other words, with everything in you, you love the Lord God. And then Jesus went on to say in the 38th verse of the 22nd chapter of, of Matthew, this is the first and great command, commandment. This is the first. Love the Lord. Love the Lord God. But the way that we love the Lord God is what Jesus would say next in the point that the Apostle Paul will make when we get over to the 12th chapter and 13th chapter of Romans. So here he says in verse 39, and the second is like to it, is like unto it, is just like it. If, if it's just like it means it is saying the same thing. The way that you and I show our love for God is in the love that we show toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. So he says, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You love your neighbor just as you love yourself. Treat your neighbor just as you would treat yourself. You wouldn't want to harm your neighbor, so uh, harm yourself. So why would you want to harm your neighbor? And that would be the point that he's that 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 uh, the apostle Paul is going to make here in just a moment. So in verse forty says, "On these two commandments, Jesus Jesus says here, hang all the law and the prophets." Every bit of those things, of the teaching of the law, the teaching of the prophets, every bit of those can be hung on this thing called love. Love, it would be the fulfillment of the law. And then our lesson shifts to the, the 12th chapter of Romans where we've been. We've been in Romans and we have gone through this and we, we have discussed justification that where, where the Lord has declared us righteous, has declared us righteous. This is God doing this himself and, and delivering us from the penalty of sin forever and ever. Even though man will want to put us back under the penalty of sin, God has delivered us from it no matter what anyone else says. The, the first verse of the eighth chapter of Romans says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ. Remember that in Christ as we start going through these first two verses here in the in the 12th chapter of Romans. He says here that that He's also delivered us from, he's also so sanctified us or is sanctifying us. We are going through this process of sanctification where we will del be delivered from the power of sin. Be delivered because we're not totally de delivered from the power of sin. The old man is, is rendered inactive, but he is still there. And every now and then he can rear his ugly head 
and we'll go the opposite direction of where we're supposed to be going. So we, we'll, we're we delivered from the power of sin. Sin doesn't have the power of us anymore. We still make the choice whether we're going to follow through with that or not. And though that is the thing that God is doing where he is, he is bringing us to a point that he wants us to be one day delivered from even the presence of sin out of this life into the precious arms of Jesus Christ. So the, he says here in the first verse, the apostle Paul says, I beg you, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. He said, I beseech you, I, I, I'm begging you. In other words, I'm not gonna even say, I command you at this point. Yes, everyone else is going to say, I command you, but I'm going to beg you. I'm, I'm going to beg you to do this out of the, the very love that you have for the Lord because of what he has done for you. He said, I bese beseech you, therefore, brother. Now, that word, therefore, I noticed that everyone kind of alluded to that word, therefore, as we read through and, and studied this lesson. When we, whenever we see the word, therefore, we need to ask, what is it there for? It was there to, to help us to understand that he was not only talking about the last few verses of the 11th chapter there, but the entire first 11 chapters that he had written. Now he's getting down to the close and the application of all the other things that he had written by faith, by all of those things. Now he's going to sum them up and and help us in practical application of being a Christian, talking to these people that were there in Rome, even under the Roman authority at this time, even under Caesar Nero, who would actually have Paul's head cut off, but he's still preaching and teaching the gospel to them through this letter right here. Thank God for this letter. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, all those things that we have written before, by the mercies of God, because God has been so good to us, that's why we should do these things right here. We should do them out of pure gratitude for what God has already done for us, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He says here, you, that we ought to present our bodies. Now, I actually labeled this particular verse, and I, I, I do that sometimes just to keep my mind focused on actually what's going on in that, that particular verse. And I, I labeled this as a holy presentation. When we present something or yield something to someone, he this is what the apostle is saying here. I, I'm begging you because God has been so good to us and out of pure gratitude for him that you give yourself to God. Give yourself, present yourself to God, hand yourself over your mind, body, and spirit over to God. The only thing that you really have that you truly own is you and you can present that back. And those of us that have been, that are saved, we have actually been bought with a price and we should because he is so wonderful and good to us. So here he says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, when we hear the word sacrifice, our mind immediately goes back to the sacrificial system. Just as we was talking about those lambs that were that the that were being examined by the religious leaders of that time before they they actually sacrificed them, when that lamb was was put on the altar, it was dead. It was killed. It was dead. It couldn't move at all. But the, these when the, he's talk what he's talking about here is a living sacrifice. We're presenting ourselves not dead. A dead sacrifice can't do anything. These sacrifices are actually supposed to be able to operate and do things that that the, the Lord wants us to do when we present ourselves, when we sacrifice our, ourselves for him, not, 
not life going out of us, not a dead sacrifice, but a living sacrifice or a quickened sacrifice. We this daily laying aside what we want to do, what the Lord wants us to do, to be involved in the things of, of Christ, to, to promote the kingdom of Jesus Christ. It, a living sacrifice, a dead sacrifice couldn't promote the Lord, couldn't promote the kingdom of God. There's no love in a in a dead sacrifice. In, in that which is dead, it is dead. It can't do anything but a living sacrifice. Not only a living sacrifice, but it also has another, another thing here to describe this sacrifice. This sacrifice is also holy. Holy takes it to another level also because holy means it is sacred. It is consecrated. It is set apart. It is sanctified. It is there for the service of God. This, this, this sacrifice is there for the service of God. A dead sacrifice can't do anything. It's dead. After it's cooked off, that's all it can do. It, it's, it's nothing to, to, that the Lord can do with that which is dead. So a living sacrifice, holy Holy, this, this thing is dedicated for the services of God, doing the will of God, doing what God wants us to do or requires of us as being people of God. Not only holy, but also acceptable unto God. Acceptable, when you look up the Greek term for that, what this means, it means fully agreeable with what God wants what God desires. Our desire is, is, is meshed into the, the desire of God. So we acceptable unto God are well-pleasing. Well-pleasing, that, that's the other part of describing the, the Greek word that, that the apostle is talking about here. Well, there's only way, one way that we can please God. He has told us that without faith, it's impossible to please him there in, in Hebrews 11 and 6. So we can't please God without faith, but we are sac sacrificing everything in us, wanting to be there for the Lord, do the things that the Lord wants us to do, and giving ourselves completely to him in this sacrifice, a living sacrifice, holy, consecrated, set apart for the service of the God, full of faith to act upon the things that the Lord wants us to do. You have to truly believe in the Lord, believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him to give yourself as a living sacrifice, to even be a person that has been declared holy, even be a person that is declared righteous by God, the person God declares righteous, but acceptable or pleasing to God not just anyone, but pleasing to God, because more than likely, if you are a living sacrifice and you are holy and you are pleasing to God, more than likely, you won't be pleasing to everybody. You won't be pleasing to a whole lot of men. You, you'll, you'll be pleasing to God. You'll, you'll desire the will of God, which is your reasonable service or your logical response to how good God has been to you, which we find in this in this word is is our spiritual worship. This is our spiritual worship that that we give ourselves to the Lord. Now, now the Lord can use us. Now, given living us giving ourselves a living sacrifice. This is this, this is kind of because we're there to be holy and and, and acceptable. This this presents a problem. When we believers think about this, we look at it and we say, well, wait a minute, I have some hiccups and downfalls every now and then, and the just man falling seven times, and I find myself falling more times than the just man sometimes. But the good part about this is what we mentioned a moment ago when we said that the apostle said in the eighth chapter, verse one, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ. By the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. But these are people that are in Christ. So when, even when your hiccup happened, God already has you. You're in Christ. Matter of fact, he said, Jesus said that you're in my hands or in my father's hand also there in John 10 and no man can pluck you out. 
And th at this point, you can just give yourself totally and completely to the Lord. But that's not all the apostle said. He said also in the in the second verse of the of the of Romans the the twelfth chapter, he says, "And be not conformed to this world." but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and that acceptable and perfect will of God. This is a wonderful scripture right here. It says, be not mashed or forced into the mold that our age right now has, the, the time that we are living in has. We don't be conformed to this world. Now, the, the way that, that, that most of us right now are conformed or are, are put into this mode is when we're, we're watching different things on, on, on the television. We'll, we'll watch things and before you know it, we, we desire to have one. We don't know what it is, but it looks like everyone else has one. So we want one too. And we, we just get pushed into this mode. We, we, we we watch movies and stuff like that before you you know it you want to have the life that that person is having even though it's a life that is disgraceful and 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 bad but you still because of associating yourself with it you're being pushed into that mode well or in our time we're seeing things happen that are different than any at any other time while we realize that some things we we have to pray about. We have to love that person into submission. We never come to the point where we say that those things that are sin are not sin anymore. If they are wrong, according to the scripture, if they were wrong then when the Lord said them that they were wrong, they're wrong now. Even if we are doing them as believers, they are still wrong and we should never prop them up and, and act like now the Lord has put away the word of God. That, that's a, a sense of being conformed to the world. The world will try to conform you and say, but that's okay. That's okay for you to do that. No, it's not okay for you to, to, to tell lies all the time. It, it, you may have a propensity toward lying, but it's, no, it's not okay to do it. Anyone might, might have a propensity toward any type of sin, but it's not okay to do that sin. It's not okay. It's still wrong, according to the word of God. So don't be pushed into the mold that the world wants you to be pushed into. But the apostle says, but be ye transformed. Metamorphosis, are that which happened to Jesus there at the Mount of Transfiguration, where he was transfigured before these disciples and they were able to see him but that there as he had met with with Moses and Elijah the law and the prophets and they were talking concerning his death and the disciples got to see him in this glorified state but here be ye transformed how by the renewing of your mind having a mind a change of mind now this is this is this is a passive transformation. So it, we we say that th this is something that we can't accomplish on our own. We can just say I want to do it and 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 think that it's going to happen. It's not going to happen like that. This is something that is that takes place under the power of the Holy Spirit as we seek the Lord more, as we study the Word of God more. These are this is a transformation that happens. It doesn't transform all of a sudden like some people would want it to. So you'll see someone and you'll want to get down on them because they hadn't got to the place that you want them to be in or hadn't matured to the place that you have matured to. So we'll get down upon that person and and start to drag them down, but the, the scripture is letting us know here that this is a transformation, that, that it, it happens in time. It happens actually in the Lord's time. The Lord helps, has, helps us accomplish this this transform by the renewing of our mind. Our mind is transformed as we bring ourselves where the blessings of the Lord are flowing, where his word is flowing, where we, we hear the word and, and, and that faith comes by hearing the word or we study the word and, and now we're not ashamed of, of sharing that word. So 
here by the renewing of our mind, our mind having a total change, change changing, not, not all of a sudden, but changing, that ye may prove or discern May, that you may discern or, or know it. You have been able to put this through a test or a grid. You may, that you may be able to prove what is that good. Good, even when we can't conceive what it is, we, how good it is or, or this, this thing to be, the will of God is, even if we can't, can't, can't get it in our mind, conceive it. But we can, out of experience, know that God is good, that which is good and acceptable, that acceptable, when we recognize it's good, we know that it's good and, and it would be a hearty endorsement by us as believers when we get to the point where we accept the will of God and a perfect will of God. Perfect is when we, in that, we achieve the desire end that God has in mind. This is where God wants us to be. This is what God's will is. We delight ourselves in the Lord and he gives us the desires of our heart. He brings us to a certain place and he helps us to, to perform this. We, we, we approve it, but it was God that helped us to get here. And then our lesson switches to the 13th chapter of, of this Romans. So he says here, helping us to understand the fulfillment of, of the law, the love that fulfills the law. He says, owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. This is a most powerful scripture here because in this he started out talking about the powers that are over the people at this time the governmental powers that that are that are over over everyone he was talking about a person like Caesar Nero as we mentioned earlier who was in power at that time but he was say, saying here to owe no man anything he wasn't talking about doesn't don't go out and get a loan if you can afford to pay it if you can pay it that's that's fine he was he he, uh, he he kind of alluding to things, but not being owing someone and never paying them back. But he wanted us to understand this though, but to love one another, you can owe them this, owe them love, always stay in debt to love. This is the debt that you can never pay off. Yes, I know you can, seems like you can never pay off the light bill or the gas bill or, or things like that, but this is the love. This is something that you really never pay off is to love one another. For he that loveth has fulfilled the law, the apostle says, and he went on to sum that up in the next two verses. He said, for this, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not cover. And if there be any other commandment other than those right there, other than adultery, killing, stealing, or bearing false witness, or even coveting, wanting something you already have enough of, if, if any other commandments come in there, he said, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, Verse 10 says, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. If you love me, you won't hurt me in that way. Father God, we do thank you today for the study of your word. And Father, we pray that this word will get in our hearts and minds, simmer on us all the day long. Lord, help us to be better servants for you because, Lord, you have implanted this word in our heart. Lord, we pray that you'll search our hearts. Forgive us of sin. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.